to my channel welcome back um again my name is jackie wangari your host and we talk everything nine to five in the corporate workspace we talk the good the bad and the ugly and what i do i bring experts in this field to just come and talk to anything that relates to people to the human aspect um anything legal so yeah really welcome i'm very excited to have back my guest um, my BFF, my legal friend, um, Georgina Gaka Ogalo Omondi, and I got it right. So yes, welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Wangari. Hey, Georgina. Hi, Wangari. How are you? I am okay. Today, I'm so excited about the topic we're talking about because we're talking about contracts. Yeah? yeah. Very important. Yeah. So you've gotten a new job. You're so excited, and they send you. A uh, contract or like a letter of offer. Actually, let's start there. What's the difference between the two? What's the difference between a letter of offer and a contract? Okay, so different organizations do different documents. So there's a letter of offer, which is basically the intent that they want to bring you on as yeah. an employee. Yeah. Some organizations use that letter of, 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 of offer. It entails everything yeah. that will be in part of your engagement with them, mm -hmm. which also acts as your contract. Okay. Other organizations have a letter of offer which is basically this is what the terms are. Um, then you can just have like a soft acceptance either via email or at the bottom of the of the, the letter. And then later on, they'll send you the long worded contract. So it just depends what organizations do. But sometimes you can they can be used synonymously or other times they're used in different contexts. Okay, perfect. Mm. So like these offers can be made verbally or formally. Mm -hmm. So legally, are both of them like okay? And which one do you recommend okay. people to go with? So generally, people always believe that a contract of employment has to be written. Yeah. You know, under the Employment Act, it's actually a verbal, yeah. uh, written, expressed and implied. Expressed and implied. Or expressed or implied. Or implied. Yes. Okay. So yep. basically, you can have a verbal agreement that I will engage you as yep. my employee to do a certain thing and I'll pay you an amount of money. Yeah. And then the one for that, that's, that's done verbally. The implied one would be a situation where <laughs> yeah. basically there hasn't been a verbal agreement on what the engagement in and even what your rules are, but you're given work. And at the end of that month or period, at the end of week or end of month, I pay you an amount of money. So that's an implied engagement. Oh. Yeah. And those situations usually happen, like let's say if your contract expires, yeah. And no one tells you anything, but you keep on working, keep on working. and you get paid at the end of the month. So okay. it's very critical when your contract is expi expiring, especially for employers, to know what the expiry date for the contract is, especially for fixed-term contracts, yeah. and either renew or communicate you're not renewing. Yeah. Because any day after that, that you the person still comes to work, and you're paying them their salary, they are your employee. Okay, so if it's not clear, this is the end date and this is when you're terminated. You yeah. You if you keep coming to work and you're paid, <laughs> okay. they're, you're, they're still employees. So, oh, wow, so that's, that's interesting. Yeah, so that's in terms of the definition of uh, contract of employment. Okay, cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in terms of contracts, um, so we're just going to talk about contracts. What should, because you know, you usually get excited when you're signing your contract, but mm. what are the key things that you should look for when you're signing the contracts? Because some of those things can really hold you back or you can be told you well you signed up to this um, mm -hmm. i've seen very different types of terms put in contracts but like what exactly should be in the contract okay so b what the critical um, elements that should be in the contract under the law are first of all your name and address your mm -hmm. employer's name and address i know it would sound why why employer but it's very critical to know who you're being employed by okay because you can have a situation where one organization did your interview yeah but you're actually working for a subsidiary oh okay yeah 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 so and then other situations where you are engaged by a company but mm. that is an outsourcing company so you're engaged to go work in another, another entity oh, yeah. but that is actually not your employer okay. so it's actually the outsource entity so it's very clear it has to be very clear who your employer is because a lot of times people come and say but i'm working in this bank or working in this factory but the factory and the bank are actually not your employer it's actually the outsourced um, agency that is your employer um, another critical element is the duration of your contract okay. some some contracts are open-ended in the sense that you start working now until it, it doesn't have a fixed date others have a fixed date which is very important for you in terms of planning whether um, the contract is going to be renewed or not later mm. on uh, another critical element that everybody of course always screams to page two or three of the contract is the remuneration yeah, yeah how much am i going to get out of this yeah so when you're looking at remuneration always look at 
the terms in the contract are, is it a net salary or basic salary? Yeah. So net salary is after all the deductions, uh, statutory deductions in terms of tax, um, your contributions to NSSF and NHIF, yeah. and any other and any other deductions. So be clear that this is your basic salary. If it's your basic, there's going to be deductions. If it's your net, that's what you'll be getting after all those deductions. Okay. Cool. Um, and then all other benefits that will come with it. Like let's yeah. if you're getting medical cover, if you're getting any other allowances, yeah. that should also come out clearly. From the employer's perspective, it's always important that the law requires that a person gets a basic salary and a house allowance. Oh, house allowance is actually... Yes, it's okay. a legal requirement in terms of house allowance. So basically yeah. what the law is that you get either a house or a house allowance. Yeah. But you have situations where employers factor in that I give you a salary and this salary is consolidated. So it factors basic salary and house allowance, but it has to be indicated consolidated. Okay. Because the con if you just indicate basic salary, then where's the house allowance element, which is a legal requirement? Yeah. Mm. But why house allowance? Like, that's just kind of... Because the, the law actually gives you that house allowance. So if, um, and some people ask me, so what is this house allowance as a percentage? Um, it is 15% of your basic salary. Yeah. If you're going to have it as a separate en element okay. under your um, under your remuneration, okay. if it's not, then the consolidated amount would factor in this house allowance. Okay. Yeah, because okay. the law is either you give the the person housing okay. or you give a house allowance. Okay. But that house allowance can also be consolidated in your salary. And usually, from um, certain organisations have that set out at lower cadres. But for higher cadres, it's a consolidated salary factors in also the house allowance. Okay. Yeah. So funny because I used to think. I mean, I've been in in contracts or in conversations where people sell that as a benefit oh but we're giving you like house allowance but actually it's just legally that's yeah it's, le <laughs> it's a legal requirement you it's have a, with that house allowance a, so it's a legal yeah yeah so the terms you have to really look into that another thing that is also important is is that you're looking at what other benefits in terms of your negotiations are the things you negotiated on are they also included in yeah. terms of um in in your contract of employment so we already discussed the remuneration the benefits the duration of of the what the contract and then also where are you working from where? Yeah, yes yeah. so some organizations yes they're based in Nairobi they don't have any other branches but maybe down the line they would grow yeah. are you in a position to move to all these other branches is it set out in your so contract that should be put in the contract. so in your contract yes so from even the employer's perspective it's very critical that you have indicate that you're working from Nairobi but we can move you to any other branch you or station, station yeah within a certain region okay. so you're looking at how far can I go Okay. So I can start Nairobi, then find out I'm in Lodwa, and then I can't come back and say, but no, I only wanted to work in Nairobi it's because like you signed a contract, contract that yeah, says yeah, it's yeah. Nairobi, but we can move you to any other place. Okay. So from an employee's perspective, it's very important that they find out. So I want us to delve into the contract. So let's look at the probation. I know there's usually a probation clause. That's what mm. it's called, clause. Yes. It's so legal. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the probation clause. The probation is usually there. Yeah. So yeah, let's talk about that. Okay. So probation, basically what it is, is basically it's a trial period for both the employer and employee mm -hmm. it's a situation it's a situation where the employee can also look at what they're doing the organization that they're in is whether things are working out very well and also from the employer's perspective is that the employee is meeting up to what the intentions are in terms of performance um, and the reason why I say trial and it's easier to get out of it is because under the law to probation requires a, a just a seven days notice yeah. if uh, you're terminating or coming out of the contract during the probation period yeah. um, Generally, it runs from three or six months based on what the contract is. Um, and our laws, you're not allowed to put somebody on probation beyond a year. So the maximum a person can be on is a year. And the example I give is that if your initial probation period is six months, you can only extend probation again, but by the consent of, you have to consult, inform the employee, and the consent of the employees to extend that probation period. Okay. So that's why maximum is a uh, one year period. Uh, probation is also set out in the contract, but you can also have a probationary contract. So it's just a contract that is, oh, okay. you, you are engaged, you are employed, but it's a probationary contract separate okay. and then after the probation period be given now a proper contract of employment with a term okay cool. so those are the two scenarios you can find yourself especially for awesome. probation that's yeah. quite clear i just wanted to delve into um remuneration okay mm -hmm. so you're negotiating your salary and your package what is negotiable in the contract okay is probation negotiable 
is what is negotiable all the elements in a contract are negotiable everything everything wow. because the thing is at that point as you say it is negotiations yeah so um the employer would be looking at certain terms mm -hmm. and the employee is also looking at certain terms yeah i would say don't go into negotiations where every single element you as an employee you want to negotiate but yeah. look at some of the things that are critical um remuneration i know is very big yeah and in terms of uh, a critical element yeah. uh, for negotiation yeah. so you're looking at this is what i uh, would be my expectations are and this is what the employer is looking at in terms of remuneration um other elements that you, you're looking at in terms of negotiation is also um the things that are very difficult to somewhat change in terms of scope and the other contractual parts in terms of the, the low applicable modes of uh, dispute resolution sometimes they'll be the standard form yeah. but a contract as it is is that both parties are agreeing to the terms that are in the contract yeah so you sh you need to have that room for negotiation okay cool yeah. cool yes. so in terms of salary so um you said that's one of the terms that's, that's the one big one people usually um negotiate about mm -hmm. um is it legal for employers to ask for like past pay slips so that they know where to put you in terms of their salaries? Like, mm -hmm. what's your take on that? Okay. Yeah. So basically, for some employers, they would need your pay slip to just see what you've received in the past, mm -hmm. and then see if they can align that or even pay you more. Yeah. Um, and then others, it's more from a, a very administrative perspective. Like, if you filled in a form and you said this is how much I was being paid, they actually need to. S they would want to confirm that in terms of a pay slip because there have been instances where people People say they've been paid this amount of money and they actually haven't. Yeah. Um, there's even been litigation on that. It still comes down to you are still at the negotiation paid so yeah. per position. So there's nothing that you're being forced to do. Yeah. So you can produce your pay slip. You can also say that I'm, I'm not in a position to produce my pay slip yeah. and then see how it goes from there going ahead. Okay. Yeah. Cool. But there's nothing forcing you to produce the pay slip. Yeah. Yes. And so what's your take? People should be paid, you know, based on their value and their titles and not just based on, you know, what uh yeah you're looking at you're not really you're not you're paying the person you're paying yeah. somebody to do a certain role yeah so and then the, when you're looking at uh the person that's coming in you're looking at what are they coming to bring in to the organization what yeah. value they're adding to the organization yeah yeah but uh, highly that is some of the criteria you're looking at so when you from the perspective of an employee you're trying to sell yourself in sense that this is a value i'm coming yeah okay i'm coming on board with yeah yeah cool and then I know another big one. I know some that's something we don't often think about is the notice period. I mm. know notice periods can range for one month, to have had some take one year. Yes. You know, one, yes. Is, is then that something negotiable? Yeah. Yes. So yeah. Because a lot of times when you have gone through the interviews, you're really excited. Yeah. You've gotten the job offer, and a lot of times people don't even look at the terms of the contract. They just yeah. look like as I told you, it's flipped to page two where the remuneration, remuneration. is. I don't even look at everything else. And then a couple of years down the line, you now maybe. You have got another position somewhere else uh, you're looking at other things and you want to leave the organization yeah then you have to go back to the fine print so you put in your resignation letter and he's like um sorry you have a notice period under your contract and th that time is when now you go back to the fine print in the contract and the notice period usually ranges from anything from a month to three months yeah so what is expected of you in the sense that you are giving your employer one month's notice that you be terminating the contract yeah and during that one month period you expect it to continue working do the respective handovers yep. during that one month period if an employer feels that during that one month period that they don't need you still on board physically they can actually either ask you to work from home or they'll just put you on a like a, a leave but still pay you during that period yeah. or they just pay you out and they yeah. say okay we've gotten your one month the notice that you've given but we're okay by the end of the week you can leave and we'll pay you the one month notice awesome. similarly as an employee and it's not a, it's a similar as an employee if you're going to leave immediately Immediately, but you have a notice period under your contract, then you need to pay your employer because yeah, yeah. the, the clauses usually re read it's one month's notice or one month's salary, salary in lieu of notice, and that applies both directions so, so is for that both employer and employee. Or gross, so it just depends what's in the contract. What your salary is at that time, what is okay. in the contract okay. at that time. Okay, oh, yeah. at that time, at that time, because you see, you can sign a contract today, oh, and in two, three years' time, your salary has increased. Increased. Yes, oh, that's so smart, very clever. I, I actually thinking about that that's smart okay cool mm -hmm. um so what are the cases where people asking for three months notice period some like a year you mm -hmm. know um Okay, so for some organizations, it's not as easy to maybe for that position that you're in, especially from mid-management to managerial levels, it's hard to do that replacement. Yeah. So you're looking at giving them, uh, the employer, a 
period of time where number one you do your handovers yeah because maybe you have a lot of people you're overseeing um and then also during that period they're also trying to replace you within the organization so that's why it's longer periods the, high, the higher you go generally it's a longer period the three months even moves into sometimes to six months it also depends on also your position helps them from also a pr perspective um if you're at a level of ceo they also need to have that communication yeah. to the public that you're, you're the person has resigned or they're long in that position and also come to replace them without losing that um how do i call it the confidence and trust that they would have out in in uh, in, in the world yeah. about what is happening so that's why longer periods okay. uh, and lower levels is a one month which one is month? which is it is reasonable okay cool, yes cool, cool, cool. Mm. so um is there anything else you wanted to cover in terms of sending the contracts mm. and that of offers um i think the most important is please read the contracts <laughs> Yeah. Do you, uh, do you do you tell people would you advise people to get a lawyer to just review it? Um as much as I'm a lawyer and I do review contracts, I think it's something of what is your intention coming in and what would you want in, in your contract. Look at it from that perspective. Yeah. And if there's something you don't understand, then yes, you can get somebody to come in and explain certain aspects. Or if you're looking to negotiate, then you wouldn't have your lawyer come in to negotiate for you. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, not, it's not a good, really good sign so yeah, to bring my lawyer for <laughs> negotiations because the employer would, of course, be like, I'm I, already lawyer involved <laughs> now. Yeah. Um, so the lawyer going to be there at every single stage. Yeah. But just to understand understand yeah so if it's a very technical um, contract have somebody review it and look at it for you and then pass on your comments <laughs> <Excuse me>. but <laughs> in, sorry <laughs> bless you thank you um, but in all situations please just look through the contract and the terms you know it's a very exciting time to get into uh, engagement or employment and a lot of times you oversee a, a, a lot of these things um, another important thing that I actually m missed out uh, prior is your job description Okay. Please very clear. It has to be set out in your contract or an addendum to the contract what your job description is. Is that what are you doing? Yeah. So if I employ you to be developing certain applications with the organization and then all of a sudden now you're serving tea <laughs> and other things, yeah, yeah. which is also a job, but yeah. it's not within your role. Yeah. Yes. Then that falls out the scope outside the scope of the contract of employment. Okay, cool, yeah. cool, cool. Very mm. interesting. Just a quick question. In the contracts, I know some ask you to do these health checks just to t check your status, like HIV, like if you have high blood pressure. So what's the deal with that? Is that actually legal? Yeah. Um, for the health checks, it's really about whether it's an inherent requirement of the job. So when I yeah. mean inherent requirement is that for you to do the job, you have to be of a certain health status in terms yeah. of fitness. Um, I'll give examples of certain jobs that would require maybe a health check. Is like let's say if you're taking up, you're a pilot, yes. Yes. or you're working in the healthcare, yeah. um, where there's co close contact with the with other with your clients or other customers, there would re be a requirement for maybe a health check. Even jobs that people take outside the country, like the jobs you have people going in Saudi Arabia, Dubai, they just want to know how your situation is. Um, how do, does it work out if somebody doesn't want to do the health check? Yeah. You're still in a position to say you, you don't want to participate in the health check. Yeah. But it might be a requirement for the employer that you do the health check. Okay. Um, the other element is is that you can do the health check, but your status and uh, private medical information is not revealed. The certificate that the doctor just issues is just a certificate of fitness. Yeah. That just to say that the person is fit to do this job, but not outlining every single condition that the person have. That I think is probably a, a balance in terms of if you don't want your private medical information to go go out there, but you still have a position to just not do the health check. Um, uh, but you know it might affect negatively in terms of the, the process ahead if yeah. it's a inherent requirement. Another thing for employers is that they are um, under the law, they are protection in terms of a person is not supposed to be discriminated based on their medical condition. Yes. So their HIV status, they should not be discriminated on in terms of the employment that they're doing. But you always have to balance it out in sense that what kind of work are they doing? Yeah. Um, and that's a level of care and contact that is needed. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, and I think the last one is usually is around like working hours, especially very interesting with these COVID times and we're working from home. I think mm. usually the contract says working from eight to five, but you know, with working from home, mm. you the eight to five has completely changed. Mm. Um, yeah, what happens there when you're working overtime and you're like sometimes you're working from eight to like midnight and yeah. Okay. 
So even pre-COVID, there would still be the overtime element. And usually it comes back again to what are the terms of the contract and the, uh, the organization's policies. Usually in a contract, there is you work from 8 o'clock to 5 o'clock. But then there's always a very nice line after that full stop of 5 o'clock that says that you will also sometimes be required to work over and above those requires the, the hours set out above. And this, in essence, basically is factored into your consolidated salary. Okay. So it's basically they're looking at the larger package that you're paid for covers the 8 to 5 plus additional hours. Additional In situations hours. where that additional sentence is not there, then the organization will look at overtime and an overtime pay. Yeah. And even in the policy to outline what these overtime payments will be, um, and also what cadres of employees would get the overtime. Okay. From usually um, middle to middle level to managerial, there isn't usually that overtime aspect because it's factored into, into that nice package that you get. Um, but um, at the minimum under our laws, if you're at minimum wage and you do work overtime, there are protections in sense that the person is required to pay you overtime. overtime. And okay. overtime is paid here. I've okay. seen a lot of, um, for especially in the manufacturing industry, they're very keen about overtime payments. Okay, cool, cool. Yes. Very, very clear. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have any questions on my side. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about in terms of the contract, mm -hmm. letters of offers? What should people look up, out for? Okay. So first of all, please read your contract of employment. Yes. I know it's a very exciting time. You've just gotten a job offer. But look at it realistically in terms of, am I able to do everything that the contract says? Yeah. Do I also have room for negotiation? Yeah. Because basically, is that this is the offer that is on the table. And a lot of times people say, yes, at that point, because you want the job, the employer would look like they have the upper hand. Sometimes yeah. there's room for negotiation. Um, and then you look at inherently what do I want out of this as an employee? Can I come and work under certain terms? And they also do share with you your human resource policies which apply to you. So the contract okay. of employment will be given to you, but you'll say that you are subject to the policies and procedures within an organization. So it's very critical that going in, you also read what these policies oh, and procedures Oh, interesting. Say. So you don't get those after you read the contract? Sometimes, you just... like most times, you will get them after. Yeah. But it's because these are just basically the rules within which the organization operates. Okay. So even on the onboarding, in the onboarding stage, you are given the policies. And sometimes, you, most times, you're actually given a form to fill in that yeah. you've read it and you and consent you to all of it. Yeah. So a lot of it is comes down to if you can't work within certain rules and policies, you still come back to your probation period if this really can't work out for me based on what my ethos are or what I want to do then you're looking at probably exiting but if if you can work within it then the policies still also apply to you so you also have to acquaint yourself very well with um, the policies of an organization because we've seen a lot of litigation coming up in sense of the things maybe that you say um, can be portrayed to be meaning be, can be portrayed to mean what the organization is saying and that's not the right position. Um, in terms of some of the things that you do also may be contrary to what is in the policy. So it's very yeah. important to also read your policies. So would you recommend that we ask for policies before like we sign just to acquaint or do, is it okay just to if they're willing Sometimes to... Sometimes you can even find some of those policies even on the online, website. On the website. Yeah. They're yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but if you really feel you want to also just acquaint yourself, yeah. you can ask for it. Okay. Most times guys, people get it on their own on body situation. Yeah, yeah. But you see you're still probably Probably the probation period of three to six months. Yeah, yeah. okay, gotcha. Yeah. So it's like going into something knowing that this is what the institution is, this is what they believe in, and these are their rules and policies, and just aligning yourself with that. Awesome. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Mm. Awesome. Anything else? Or that's it. Other than that, then other than just please, please read the, <laughs> the black and white on your contracts. I think it's just a, a situation where um, both each person is from the employer and employee's perspective. Each person is trying to get something out of this. Employer wants you to work. You want to be paid a salary for this work. And yeah. along the way, people grow. Awesome. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Georgina, for your time. That was Georgina. Georgina Gaka Ogalo Omondi. Yeah. <laughs> um, she's been really good in, in terms of explaining with contracts. I know it's a really, really exciting time for people, but just read them. Read and question like every line. And if you like have any questions, you know, just find someone who's been in a similar situation to ask um, or just for some verification or if you have a friend who's like a lawyer, feel free to ask. But yeah, the bottom line for this is just to make sure you read, you align with the contract and the policy. And so just to set you up for success in any organizations that you go to into. So thank you. So don't forget to like, subscribe and share. And we'll see you next time. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao.